Recently, we've been starting to see more and more of the inherent problems with democracy in the West. In internet comments, I see increasing amounts of people saying that they believe in absolute monarchy. Books such as Hans Hermann Hoppe's Democracy the God That Failed and Brian Kaplan's Myth of the Rational Voter have started to see this most sacred of cows seriously questioned. I thought it might be interesting to go back to the arguments of the ultimate theorist of absolute monarchy, Thomas Hobbes, who wrote Leviathan during the English Civil War. It was published in 1651. Hobbes is widely regarded as one of the most important political thinkers in history, and almost certainly the most important English political thinker. Leviathan is not simply a defence of monarchy, it is a book-length treatment of human nature itself, and why governance in the form of the state is necessary. Hobbes, like Machiavelli, has a very dim view of human nature. Men are self-interested and self-seeking, prone to cowardice and treachery, and without a strong state, so he argues, we would devolve into a state of war of all against all, the state of nature. Therefore, many of the arguments in Leviathan are our justification for government per se, that is, regardless of the form. Hobbes maintained that subjects should respect and defend the sovereign no matter the form, that is, whether it is a democracy, an aristocracy, or a monarchy. In his own life, he refused to support Charles II when he was in exile because he didn't have sovereignty. Ironically, that meant he was actually unpopular with the royalists of his own time. Nonetheless, he argues, specifically in chapter 19 of Leviathan, that of the three forms of government, absolute monarchy is superior to both democracy and aristocracy. He didn't want any separation of powers. The monarch should wield both supreme executive control and legislative control. That is, he should have the power to write laws. Before continuing, I think it's worth noting that you should not confuse absolute monarchy with modern totalitarian dictatorships. Hobbes would not call Hitler, Stalin or Robert Mugabe absolute monarchs. He'd say that, properly speaking, those one-party states were a form of aristocracy. So, why did he support absolute monarchy? He gives six reasons. Let's go through them. First, he says, and I quote, Now in monarchy, private interest is the same with the public. The riches, power and humour of a monarch arise only from the riches, strength and reputation of his subjects. For no king can be rich, nor glorious, nor secure, whose subjects are poor or contemptible or too weak through want or dissension to maintain a war against their enemies. Whereas in democracy or aristocracy, the public propensity confers not so much to the private fortune of one that is corrupt or ambitious, as doth many times a perfidious advice, a treacherous action, or a civil war. Here he's saying that the fortunes of the people and the monarch rise together, but under democracy or aristocracy, there's a disconnect between the ruling class and the people. The king can't really be corrupt because he'd only be cheating himself. The people are a part of his estate over which he is the self-interested monitor. By contrast, a member of a ruling assembly might easily enrich themselves at the expense of everyone else, and such practices might be widespread because the interests of nobles or elected representatives do not necessarily align with those of the people. A king cannot easily abdicate or fall without there being a significant effect on the rest of the country, whereas individual nobles or elected leaders can come and go relatively easily. But far from being a strength, this is a weakness, because those leaders who come and go might use their time in office to enrich themselves before they get out again. In other words, their incentives are such to make out like bandits while in power so they can live in luxury once they are out of it. I should mention that Hans Hermann Hopper also makes this point in Democracy, the God that Failed. Second, he argues that a monarch can receive wise counsel with secrecy, but an assembly cannot. Advisers to the assembly tend to be well-versed more in the acquisition of their own wealth than of knowledge, 
and are likely to give their advices in long discourses which may and do commonly excite men to action, but not govern them in it. For the understanding is by the flame of the passions, never enlightened, but dazzled. Nor is there any place or time wherein an assembly can receive counsel with secrecy because of their own multitude. There are two separate points here. First, that the very nature of the assembly ensures that rhetoric and emotion will triumph over reason in making decisions. So the advice as to what to do will necessarily be worse as a result. Second, that regardless of the advice given, because there are many people in an assembly, it's hard to keep the advice secret. Instead of one person keeping quiet, you need to keep 600 people quiet. One might think of the Brexit negotiations or the number of leaks from Washington since Trump took office. Third, the resolution of a monarch are subject to no other inconsistency than that of human nature. But in assemblies, besides that of nature, there ariseth an inconsistency from the number. For the absence of a few that would have the resolution once taken continue firm, which may happen by security, negligence or private impediments, or the diligent appearance of a few of the contrary opinion undoes today what was concluded yesterday. Here Hobbes is saying that a monarch can choose a course of action and then stick to it in the long run, whereas an assembly by its nature is liable to change its mind and therefore keeps going back on the decisions they've already made. This makes the nature of decision making in the assembly prone to short termism. Again, this is a point that Hopper makes in Democracy the God that Failed, specifically that elected representatives have a short time horizon and therefore make high time preference decisions. Hobbes is not saying that you couldn't have a fickle monarch, but rather that assemblies by their very nature will always be fickle. Fourth, a monarch cannot disagree with himself out of envy or interest, but an assembly may, and to such a height as may produce a civil war. This is quite self-explanatory, and again, my mind wanders to Brexit. Fifth, in monarchy, there is this inconvenience that any subject by the power of one man for the enriching of a favourite or flatterer may be deprived of all he possesseth, which I confess is a great and inevitable inconvenience. But in an assembly, their power is the same and they are as subject to evil counsel and to be seduced by orators as a monarch by flatterers and becoming one another's flatterers, serve one another's covetousness and ambition by turns. Whereas the favourites of a monarch are few, the favourites of an assembly are many. Now this is a very interesting point from Hobbes, who is responding to a common complaint that monarchs are particularly vulnerable to flatterers. He doesn't try to deny it, but rather owns it and acknowledges the weakness. But then he says that the situation under the assembly is even worse. Because now, rather than one person having a few flatterers, you've got 600 people with several thousand flatterers. Again, it's difficult not to think of Westminster or Washington, and he's surely right on this one. Sixth and finally, there is the problem of the infant king who must have a Lord Protector appointed, increasing the risk of ambitious individuals jockeying for power. Uh, is, he says that this is not caused by the form of government, but by the nature of men who are ambitious and unjust. In an assembly, the problem is actually compounded. In fact, the assembly is like having a permanent infant king. The number of would-be Lord Protectors is multiplied. This, again, is Hobbes taking a common criticism of monarchy and turning it back on aristocracy and democracy. He argues that all the weaknesses that come from having an infant as a king are compounded by the assembly and made worse because no actual king is ever finally crowned. So you have a permanent situation of court intrigue among would-be Lord Protectors. And I don't know why, but uh, the image of Michael Gove just popped into my head 
must be a coincidence. So anyway, there you have it. Let me list the six reasons again. Number one, the incentives of the monarch and the people are aligned, whereas those of individual members of the assembly and the people are not. Number two, advice to monarchs can be rational and kept secret, whereas advice to assemblies are prone to emotional arguments and are more difficult to keep secret. Number three, monarchs can more easily stick to their decisions in the long term, whereas assemblies are inherently prone to change both their minds and their course of action. Number four, monarchs can't disagree with themselves or have conflict of interest, so the chance of disagreements escalating into civil war is reduced. Number five, the number of flatterers under an assembly is greatly increased. Number six, the assembly produces a permanent state of court intrigue whereby everyone is a would-be Lord Protector, replicating the conditions under an infant king permanently. Now, I will leave it to you, dear viewer, to address these arguments for yourself. Should debate in the comments section become particularly spicy, I may well host a stream on this topic. My own view is that the political system matters much less than the economic system, so I am somewhat neutral on this. I have come to believe, however, that democracy is a Trojan horse for socialism, and if there was ever a time to revisit core arguments about political systems, it is now. Now get out. And a very special thanks to Stetson F. Lionel, The Ambivalent Onion, Christopher Scholholm, The Crimson Satyr, Chris, Kieran Hayward, Mr. A. M. Swainson, Radical Liberation, The Binary Surfer, Tragic Vision, Bailey and Aurora, Toyotomi Ami, Holy Spatula, Alexander, Froggy, Splice, Buck Hegit Society, Michael Meir, J. Green River, Michael Tynan, Heronius Napalm V, Vincenzo Rapio, and Edward Dara.